right. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And thanks a lot to the organizers uh, for inviting me to speak at this wonderful conference. So in this talk, I want to share my thoughts on a trend that I have been observing uh, for a few years. Uh, I want to talk about how we often cause more complexity than necessary with the, with the methods we choose. Uh, it seems to me as if we sometimes cherish complexity instead of fighting it. So let's see why that's the case and what we can do about it. Um, while my talk is based on my experience in the Scala community, uh, you don't have to be fluent with Scala at all in order to take something away from it. Now, before we can have a conversation about um, what's wrong with our relationship to complexity, uh, we need to talk about what complexity actually is. All right, I'll switch to this microphone. Yeah, and after that, um, I will go into more detail um, about this phenomenon, which I call the complexity trap. So when we say that something is complex, what it means is, according to the dictionary at least, that it's hard to separate, analyze, or solve. And the word originates from the Latin verb complexer, which means to braid. So consider a bunch of modules that are completely entangled, so much that we can neither reason about them individually anymore, nor change one of them without also changing the other. I think that's a pretty good example of complexity in software development. But it also helps to look at the origin of the word simple, the opposite of complex. Simple has its roots in the Latin adjective simplex, which means single or having one ingredient. And in software development, we have a few principles that aim to achieve simplicity in this original sense. Two examples of that that many of you will know are the single responsibility principle and separation of concerns. And one separation of concerns that we really love to enforce as functional programmers is a separation between logic and effects. So if these two concerns are not separated, it makes our code harder to reason about and more difficult to test. So we try to isolate business logic from effects and implement the former as pure functions. Um, there's a classic paper by Fred Brooks called No Silver Bullet, in which he identifies two different types of complexity. Um, essential complexity is inherent in the problem domain. So we cannot remove it because it stems from the very problem that we are supposed to solve with our software. And accidental complexity, on the other hand, is of our own making. So this is complexity that is created by software developers. And in principle, it's possible to remove complexity of this type. Uh, according to Brooks, we spend most of our time these days tackling essential complexity. And there's not much accidental complexity left. <coughs> So he argues that reducing it further will not yield a lot of benefit. But that statement is from 1986. And today it's 2018. And I don't know about you, but I have to strongly disagree. I think we're spending an awful amount of time creating and managing accidental complexity. And we should put our focus much more on minimizing it. So in the remainder of this talk, I'm mainly talking about accidental complexity. Over time, various metrics for complexity have been developed, especially for code complexity. And one of them that many of you might know is um, cyclomatic complexity, which was uh, introduced by McCabe in the 70s. The more different code paths there are in a function, uh, the higher its complexity. So one of the ways that uh, complexity of a function is increased is through branching, like pattern matching expressions or if expressions. 
And the higher the complexity of a function, the more test cases are necessary uh, to achieve full path coverage. There are also other relevant metrics that are related to complexity. And some of them are on a completely different level, not on the code level. For example, we can measure the extent of coupling between the modules of a system. So the more dependencies there are between the modules of a system, the higher its overall complexity. So um, cyclomatic complexity is OK as a metric of how hard it is to test a function. However, I'm actually even more interested in how difficult it is to reason about what a function is doing or a program is doing or even a whole system or a system of systems is doing. Which means I'm interested in cognitive complexity as well. Now, in this example, in the imperative version of the sum of primes functions, um, a lot of complexity stems from mutable state and from flow control statements. And the functional version doesn't have any of that. So you could say that we are at a bit of at an advantage as functional programmers. Nevertheless, I think we shouldn't be too smug about it. And um, yeah, there's actually even a metric for cognitive complexity, which was created by Sonosource. However, in my opinion, not every aspect of what constitutes cognitive complexity can actually be captured in metrics. <laughs> For example, you have syntax, boilerplate code, indirection, and all of those can add to a program's complexity as well. And I don't really know how to do that, uh, how to measure that in a systematic way. Now, you might, uh, might ask why it is so important to keep complexity in check anyway. Well, sadly, we human beings are incredibly bad at juggling with many items at once. There's a classic study by George Miller, who was a cognitive psychologist. And according to that study, we can only hold seven items in working memory at the same time, on average, plus or minus two. That's not a lot. So the more concerns are entangled and code paths there are, and the more syntax and boilerplate and indirection there is, the more difficult it will be for us to reason about what a program is doing. Typically, uh, we try to mitigate this by using abstractions. So our programs are ideally composed of a lot of small functions, and functions that are related to each other are put into the same module. And in order to reduce coupling, and thus also the complexity of the whole system, um, we hide implementation details of our modules from others that depend on them. In functional programming, we take abstraction a lot further than in many other paradigms. We often abstract over things like iteration or over data types in a way that we rarely see outside of functional programming. And this is what facilitates the definition of very, very simple functions which can be composed in many different ways and also in very unforeseen ways which is exactly uh, what allowed us to write our sum of primes functions, uh, function in a way that is um, much easier to reason about than the imperative version, which you saw on the top of the previous slide. All right. So now that we have achieved a common understanding of what I mean when I talk about complexity, um, let me introduce you to my notion of the complexity trap. And to this amazing band. Um, it might be fair to say that there's not actually a single complexity trap, but multiple traps, or at least multiple facets to it, even though they're all related to each other in one way or another. And the first trap that I want to talk about is what I call neglecting the costs. We often seem to ignore the costs of the approaches and techniques that we choose to implement our programs. Usually the intentions are actually good. So 
We choose an approach explicitly because we want to reduce the boilerplate in our code base. But sometimes doing that comes with a cost. And that cost can even be new complexity at a different level, which might be worse than what we had before. Now, let me illustrate this with an example. In general, scrap your boilerplate is a very desirable principle to follow because the more boilerplate code we write, um, the higher the complexity of our program and the more likely it also is that we introduce bugs that we could easily avoid if we didn't write this boilerplate code at all. There's one way of scrapping boilerplate that is very popular in the Scala community and that I find a bit problematic. For those who are not familiar with Scala, um, the way that we define how data of a certain type is encoded to JSON and back is usually done via, by defining instances of type classes. And those instances can be defined manually or derived automatically for arbitrary record types. Now, the thing is that people rarely seem to consider the cost-value ratio of the way that they use automatically derived JSON codecs. I'm not talking about compile times, by the way, because uh, John Pretty actually did an amazing job in improving those recently. At least uh, his library, Magnolia, um, took an important part in that, I think. Now, the cost that I'm talking about is in almost all projects that I've seen, um, people use automatically derived JSON codecs on their domain model types to expose their internal domain model uh, to the outside world with just a single line of code. So you definitely scrap a lot of boilerplate and you re reduce the complexity in your code. But if you look at the bigger picture, this is the opposite of removing complexity. Because um, if you expose your domain model to the outside world like this, usually it leads to very strongly coupled systems that are very hard to evolve. And if you ask me, um, that's one of the most promising ways to create a distributed ball of mud. And it amazes me how many people are totally okay with making their internal domain model their public API especially since functional programmers are usually crazy about abstractions in order to reduce complexity. But apparently we are even more crazy about removing boilerplate. Now, if you don't want to expose your domain model to the outside world like this, but you want to avoid manually written JSON codecs, there is an alternative that is often ridiculed these days and it has its own problems, of course, which is the infamous DTO layer. So you will have a separate hierarchy of DTO types, and those can have automatically derived JSON codecs, but you will still, still need to write boilerplate code to map between your domain model and your DTO types. So in the end, it's about having to choose your poison. It seems that simply exposing your domain model with a single line of code is the most addictive poison because it gives you instant gratification. But in the long run, uh, you will have to pay the price for this. There's a variant of neglecting the costs, which I think deserves to be discussed on its own, and that's embracing industry standards. In many projects I've seen an approach or a technology is picked because it is being perceived as industry standard or as common courtesy. So the reasoning is that this is what you do in 2018. And if you ask people why to use technology X or approach X, a common reaction is that they're completely baffled to even hear such a question. And in a slightly anxious and reproachful tone, they reply with a counter question, which is, well, isn't that industry standard? Well, shipping containers certainly are industry standard. But when people say industry standard, what they actually refer to many, many times is just the latest fad. 
So something that will most probably not be industry standard anymore in two years. And if you follow this approach, it means that you adopt techniques without thinking, without thinking about the costs and about whether the benefits of that technique can even be realized in your specific situation. Okay, now it's getting controversial, I guess, because a prime example of this that I see in many Scala projects is that many people seem to feel like they will be excommunicated from the church of functional programming if they don't use free monads or tagless final. There's this mantra that you must not commit to a specific effect monad too early. So what's a Scala developer going to do? Well, one thing is for sure, they will not commit to anything. Instead, they're going to abstract over effect monads and over many, many other things, everywhere and all the time. I think there are very good reasons why you want to abstract over the effect monad when you are developing a library. For example, you provide an HTTP client library and you want to enable people to use it regardless of which effect monad they prefer. Also, if you really have the need to interpret some instructions in different ways in your application, then free monads or tagless final can be a perfectly reasonable choice. Say you have to define a data processing pipeline that needs to be executable both in Hadoop, Spark, and on a single machine. But most of the time when we write applications, that's not actually the case. So to prepare for the ability to switch from one effect monitor to another, to me, that's a bit like avoiding Postgres specific SQL because one day you might switch to MySQL. So the main reason that I see why people want to abstract over effect monads that remains is that they have effectful code, which they want to have unit testable. So how does that work? You have a function which mixes logic and effects, and in your production code, you will execute it in your favorite effect monad which means talking to a real database or external system. In your unit tests, you will execute it in the ID monad with hard-coded test data. Object-oriented programmers call this technique stubbing, and they get mocked by us for doing it. But this is exactly what it is. It's important to realize that abstracting over effect monads comes with a cost. For one, there's quite a bit of boilerplate code involved. In the previous slide, maybe you saw some of the noise in the free monad version of the function that was on that slide. But there's also the whole interpreter that you need to write, which I'm not even showing you because it's too much code for the slides. And you have to Im implement that twice, of course, for production and for your tests. And if you have a lot of conditional logic in your program, then um, things can get pretty messy here. Also, by their very definition, of course, monads are strictly sequential. So if you have some independent effects that you want to execute in parallel, you can't just abstract over monads, you also have to abstract over applicatives. And getting them to actually be executed in parallel in your target effect type is sometimes a little bit tricky. Finally, um, at least in my experience, when people abstract over effect monads, it seems to lead them to writing bigger functions that completely entangle logic and effects because they are still able to test this big function in this ID monad stub. There's an alternative to abstracting over effect monads which seems to be almost taboo in the discussion is to not abstract over it at all in your application code. So let's be honest, when we are testing with the ID monad, we are only testing the few pieces of application logic in this big effectful function. And we test that our test interpreter is working as expected. But we don't have any clue if our function is still behaving correctly 
if we run it with our production interpreter, which is talking to an external system. And that is what actually matters. So abstracting over effect monads and using the ID monad in your tests doesn't even help you with writing meaningful tests. And if we forgo this abstraction, we will be able to use our effect type in all its glory, using all its functionality. And among other things, this makes stuff like parallel execution pretty straightforward. Now, if we follow this approach, um, we have to be very strict about separating the logic of our program from the parts that are involving I.O. One way of doing that is using the functional core imperative shell architecture. So which means that we have to move all logic into the purely functional core and maybe we have to extract it from our big effectful functions into separate pure functions. So this way we can minimize the branching that is happening in the imperative shell. And we can write unit tests for all the logic in this functional core. And it can, this um, imperative shell can be covered with a small number of integration tests because it will become almost free of logic. So I think this approach does a better job um, at testing what is happening in a production-like environment than stubbing everything else out with a test interpreter. So free moments or tagless final is not a great choice if you only care about testability and not, not about the other use cases for them. And there are alternatives that are less complex and, in my opinion, at least as adequate for achieving this goal of testability. So why is it that people jump to certain solutions so quickly? Well, I think that the discourse in our community is characterized by a focus on how to use certain abstractions. And at best, we find comparisons between two abstractions like tagless final or free monad. Um, but we rarely see discussions about when not using any of those might be a viable solution. So I think we should all talk and write more about the costs of certain abstractions and have critical discussions of the trade-offs that we need to make. <laughs> because abstractions are supposed to help us uh, keep complexity in check. Um, but sometimes, as I already said, using them can come with its own complexity. And usually a given abstraction is only a perfect fit for a few particular use cases. And for other use cases, there are alternative solutions that are less complex and also more boring, actually. But I have the impression that, unfortunately, we don't like boring. We like to take the language and the compiler to their limits, and we like to adopt the latest fad. But the software systems that we work on in our jobs shouldn't be a playground or a test bed for the latest fad. So let's talk and write more about when certain abstractions are a good fit and when they are not. And when a more boring solution might be a better fit. And when someone in your team tells you this problem must be solved with free monads, don't be afraid to ask why. And in general, I would advise you to de demand to hear why an approach was chosen, which alternatives have been considered, and why they've been discarded. The last aspect of the complexity trap that I want to talk about is what I call maximum zoom. Have you ever used one of those coin-operated telescopes or maybe binoculars to zoom into some scenic detail of, uh, uh, of some nice view? Maybe you have also experienced how easy it is to lose your bearings and how difficult it is to keep track of the broader context. And I think that the same thing happens a lot in software development. So let me explain this with another example. Nowadays, many teams face a challenge that they are working on an application which has to make 
many requests to various systems. <coughs> Often this happens in a Netflix style microservice architecture where you have tons of tiny microservices and you have other services in front of those which um, orchestrate the others, aggregate data, do some further processing like filtering. And very often the effect of that is that the response times for the end user are very high. So then people start uh, introducing batching and caching of previous results and making requests in parallel that are independent. Imagine we'd be taking care of all these different concerns at the same place. That would definitely not be simple, according to our definition, having one ingredient. So that's why people implemented libraries that provide abstractions over these concerns. For example, there's Twitter Stitch, Clump, which was used at SoundCloud, but also Fetch. Now keep in mind that I don't know anything about the context in which these libraries have been created. It might be that they were the only viable solution to the problem these developers were facing after careful analysis. But in my experience from other projects, the motivation to introduce libraries like these uh, as a solution is often because there's a synchronous microservice architecture in this Netflix style. So this is just an example of how we often implement technological solutions to problems prematurely. And I think that's mostly because we don't apply systematic approaches at improving our software systems often enough. So caching, batching, parallel execution, those things will probably work okay-ish to solve this high latency issue. But if we apply a systematic approach at improving our software, we may end up with a different solution. Now, one such systematic approach is called the architecture improvement method. And if we use this method, then we work iteratively in three phases. In the analysis phase, we identify issues and improvements. In the evaluate phase, we estimate the value of issues and the effort or the cost of the improvement. And finally, in the improve phase, we apply selected improvements. One of the most important techniques in the analysis phase is root cause analysis. But I think it's also a tremendously underused technique. People often jump to solutions too quickly. So when we are faced with a problem, we immediately search for a solution for exactly this problem. In root cause analysis, we differentiate between problem and cause. So the idea is that we trace a problem to its origin and that we identify the root causes of symptoms or problems. So you continue to ask why until you have found the root cause in your causal chain. Let's apply this to our high latency problem. We could ask ourselves, why do we have such a high latency in our system? Well, because of all the requests that we need to make. And why do we need to make so many requests? Uh, well, because there are so many services that we need to fetch data from. And why do we need to do that? Well, because all services are designed around a single entity. And why is that? So at some point we realize we have an architectural problem at the macro level. And maybe if we continue to ask why long enough, we will come to the conclusion that all these services that we need to communicate with exist in exactly this way because of how the company is organized. So high latency is only a symptom. The root cause, the thing that we should try to solve, lies a lot deeper. So by making the symptom less painful, we don't really reduce the complexity in the system as a whole. Think of all the complexity that could be eliminated if we changed our architecture at the macro level. So if instead of a service in front of all those tiny microservices, we had a few slightly bigger systems that are not designed around a single entity or aggregate. 
but a whole bounded context. And the whole orchestration and aggregation layer would be gone. And browsers would talk to those bigger systems directly. But maximum zoom can also be applied to the issue with our JSON codex. If we do root cause analysis here, we might come to the question, why do we have a JSON API in the first place? Surprisingly often, the only consumer of such a JSON API is a single page application. Now, there are perfectly valid use cases for single page applications, but often they are chosen because it's industry standard. Yes, people actually say that. And which, that brings us back to the trap of embracing industry standards. But there are other reasons. We are programmers and we like to write code. So having a single page application allows us to write even more code. <laughs> and it's a new playground for doing functional programming. I mean, having applicative functors in the browser, that sounds pretty amazing, right? But imagine the unthinkable for a minute. What if we do server-side rendering of HTML instead? Now suddenly we have no need to design an evolvable JSON API anymore, which also means no need for JSON codecs. And that's, that's just what you get on the server side. Another consequence is we have no SPA anymore. So this is one complete non-trivial piece of software less to maintain. It also means faster initial load times and no duplication of business logic anymore between backend and frontend. So to summarize, we have a dramatically reduced complexity of our frontend JavaScript code. Um, to put it into, uh, in the words of Jorge Manrubia, what about if instead of trying to find a solution, you put yourself in a situation where those problem, problems don't exist. So eliminating problems altogether is always a better choice than writing code to solve them. And it doesn't matter how purely functional that code would be. So why is it that we fall for these technological solutions so often, especially when they don't actually reduce complexity and sometimes they even create a whole bunch of new complexity? I think that maybe we love programming too much. I was recently talking to someone about Rust, and that person said, a language without higher kind of types is completely useless. <laughs> In the other track right now, Lisa is showing her audience otherwise, I think. You might check with her. But there are certain abstractions that are not possible without them. Nevertheless, um, I have never seen a project fail because of a lack of higher kind of types. <laughs> Projects tend to fail because the problem domain is not well understood or because the architecture is not a good fit for the requirements or because of how the organization is structured or because of politics or people. So when we jump towards technological solutions, we often do this because we love programming. And in our case, we love functional program. And we love technological challenges. So solving a problem by writing code is our comfort zone. And that was my chance, chance to introduce some cat content into this slide deck. <laughs> um, so if we take this route, even if the actual problem uh, is, not a uh, is not a technological one, we prefer to work around non-technical problems using technological solutions, because that's what we know, um, and it's the more interesting way out of a problem. I'm working at, at a consultancy, and usually we are hired to solve challenging technological problems, but often it turns out that the important problems are not technological. I think as software engineers, our job is to solve problems and create business value. It's not our primary um, task to write code. So sometimes it means that we have to search for the root cause of a problem, and instead of solving a symptom by writing code, that we have to tackle people problems or organizational problems, or improve the architecture at the macro level. 
But I think the jumping towards technological solutions for symptoms also happens because every, everything that is not solvable with code, um, it's often seen as a given, something that you can't change anyway. I think we should all give it a try more often, consultant or not, because things are not always set in stone. So if we are serious about reducing accidental complexity, then we should question our self-concept of what it means to be a software developer. To summarize, we have to deal with a lot of accidental complexity these days for multiple reasons. For one, we adopt techniques and abstractions without analyzing and evaluating their costs and their usefulness in our specific situation. And we love solving technological problems. So let's shift our discourse and talk more about when certain abstractions are a good fit and when they are not. And let's bring more boring, but possibly simpler solutions to the table as well. And don't be afraid to demand explanations for architectural decisions in your team. Let's also slow down when we are faced with a problem, analyze its root cause, jump out of our comfort zone, even if it means that we will eliminate the problem and rob ourselves of a chance to solve it. Thank you very much. Yeah.